Okay, yeah, so yeah, so the second talk uh, will be about introduction to radio interferometry. And in this talk, uh, I will walk you through some basic knowledge you need to know about how radio interferometers work. And this is important because it actually helped us understand why the ELMA observing tool will be asking us to enter some parameters like the large angular scale or the angular resolution we want to reach. So uh, as a recap, um, radio astronomy means we are observing in the radio wavelength, which is where uh, the uh, atmosphere tra transmissions makes ground-based observations possible in this wavelength. And um, one interesting thing for radio telescope is that, as you can see, we no longer need uh, pristine glass mirrors like we typically see in optical telescopes or infrared telescopes. And this is because when we when we get to wavelengths like millimeter, centimeter, or even to meters, then it becomes really easy to ensure the smoothness of the disk. So we don't need to rely on like glass mirror anymore. And so, um, so you might uh, so uh, let me briefly explain these images. So I think so. This one is a brain bank telescope, like I mentioned before, also previously operated by NIO, this is ELMA. And I think this is also one of the Green Bank Observatory telescopes in radio. And this is VLA. And this is uh, uh, Arecibo radio telescope, which is no longer existing now, so it's already collapsed. But it was once the largest radio telescope um, in the world, like with a diameter of 200 meter, I think. But like now there is fast in China, which is 500. So that's now the long sample. And on the bottom, you can see this is a long wavelength array in New Mexico. It is uh, designed to detect wavelengths like 10 meter. And you can see that they don't even need a fish because they are using uh, dipole, dipole antennas, which I actually don't know what that is, but like, but yeah, but like in longer wavelength, you you can like don't even need to rely on um, the dishes. Okay, so um, so that's great. Like, if we don't need to rely on glass mirrors, you may think that uh, we can, of course, easily more easily build radio telescope with much larger dish size, and that should allow us to um, more easily like or even get higher resolution than optical or infrared. But that's actually not the case because um, the angular resolution for telescopes is determined by uh, lambda, the observed wavelength, over the dish size. And so even though it's easy to get to larger dish size, but remember these radio wavelengths are, um, they have a very long wavelength, right? So a longer wavelength would also decrease the angular resolution. So this uh, this is actually, lambda over d is the angular scale. So if you have large, uh, if you have longer wavelength, the angular scale will be bigger. And so larger this size is not enough because these radio wavelengths have, uh, are long, also long. So that would basically cancel out each other. So take the Hubble Space Telescope as an example. It's a optical uh, telescope. If we have um, a typical wavelength at like one micron and the length of Hubble Space Telescope is like 2.4 meter. And if we calculate the resolution, it will be like 0.13 arc second. But if we want to reach this resolution at millimeter wavelengths, uh, you can see, so it's a, a, a thousand times different. So that means we need a two kilometer size diameter dish, and that's just not possible, right? So that's why um, in um, radio in radio observations, uh, we want to use arrays of smaller dishes to synthesize uh, the um, a bigger aperture. So that's called the radio interferometry, so that we can achieve uh, similarly high angular resolutions like in optical or infrared observations. Um, yeah, so um, so first of all, what is a radio interferometer? So um, speaking of interferometer, you may recall uh, the double slit uh, double slit experiment from your physics classes that 
um, that two different waves can add up or cancel out each other and produce bright and dark patterns. And that is basically the same idea in radio interferometer. But the difference is that radio interferometer measure the interference pattern by uh, multiplying uh, these waves instead of adding, as you see in these uh, experiments. So here's an illustration of how this works. So you can see that, for example, the same signal, you can see the same signal arrives at each antennas at a different time because uh, the location of uh, antennas are different. And so these signals will then be combined in the later so that uh, they can measure the time delay and compensate for um, uh, compensate for like each antenna and, and know like um, what is the time difference. But also uh, it's not, um, if you think of like different sources, these two stars also can arrive at the same antenna uh, at a different arrival time. So this also provides information uh, on like the spatial distribution of sky brightness. So there, so there are um, two components here. So same signals arrive at different antennas and different uh, different signal arrives at the same antenna. Like all these are time delays that we need to measure. So you could imagine that we really need to precisely, uh, we really need to precisely determine these uh, arrival time. So we need very accurate clocks in these telescopes. So just to give you a sense of how accurate this is. So for example, at band 10, the highest, the highest frequency band, uh, we need uh, to, to precisely measure the time, we need to like at least um, ensure it is much more precise than one wavelength, the time of one wavelength. And in band 10, that is uh, one picosecond resolution. So that's a very high precision clock. And so after the time is measured, then the signals from each antenna are being amplified and then digital, uh, digitized and to send to the correlators. So these are, these are physical correlators, which is super cool. That, like, yeah. And um, so they are sent to the correlators for um, doing the multiplication and the inference interference pattern stuff. So here's an animation that I really like. You can see the whole process from um, signals coming in and getting reflected and focused by the, by the antenna. And then it goes into the receiver in the telescope. And so uh, inside the telescope, the signals are uh, amplified and then um, uh, being transferred to digital signals and then all uh, signals from all the antennas are sent into the correlators and it will give, out, uh, give us the raw data. So now you may be wondering how does this whole thing like eventually turn into images? So this is actually all because of Fourier transform. So Fourier, uh, the Fourier theory states that any well-behaved signal including images, because images is just a two-dimensional signal. So they can be expressed as the sum of sinusoids. So this means that these signals uh, can be easily decomposed into um, uh, waves of different frequencies. And that is really handy because, uh, because also the Fourier transform actually allows us to uh, transform back and forth without losing any information. So, um, so for radio interferometers, what they really observe is in the frequency domain. So uh, what we observe, we call them visibility as a function of U and V. So these are basically wavelengths. Uh, U and V are in units of wavelengths or frequency. This is in the frequency domain. And if we do a 2D Fourier transform, then we will get uh, the sky brightness distribution. So the relation between frequency and the image is actually just a Fourier transform. So yeah, you can see the equation form here that T is our image and V is the visibility at frequency um, domain. So um, here are some examples. 
So here you can see a typical image. It is as a function of X and Y. And if we do a 2D Fourier transform, then it will give us the visibilities. So the visibility is a, actually a, a complex quantity. So you can express it with an amplitude and base, or you could also express as a real or image imaginary part num uh, numbers. So um, you could imagine that each of this uh, each point on the visibility actually contains information of the image everywhere. So for example, like one point on this UV is actually telling us how much in this image has this certain frequency. And uh, the face is telling us where this frequency is at. Yeah, so that's the idea of uh, what interferometers measure. And um, so here are some useful Fourier transform pair that could let us um, get some idea of how this is working. So for example, the delta function, uh, the Fourier transform will become a constant because you, you can imagine that delta function basically contains infinite number of frequencies at the, uh, at the same amplitude. So that's a constant in visibility amplitude. And for elliptical Gaussian, the Fourier transform is still uh, elliptical Gaussian, but you can see um, that um, it becomes a more widely uh, widely spread Gaussian, and um, and vice versa. So if you have a more widely spread Gaussian, the Fourier transform will be much narrower. So one rule of Fourier transform is that narrow features transform to wide features, and vice versa. And another important example is that uh, the if we have a uniform disk structure, then the Fourier transform will be a Basel function, which is uh, um, basically uh, a decaying fringe fringe pattern that you can see on this image. So um, um, one interesting example here is that if we input the image of a VLA antenna, so it's also a little bit like uniform disk structure. The Fourier, in the Fourier transform, you can also somewhat see the basal function patterns. And yeah, and so the second rule of Fourier transform is sharp features like uh, the edge in this uniform disk will result in many high spatial features, but it will be decaying because like this, like the, the energy is limited, should be limited. It's still like focused on the, um, it's still like cons being constrained. So that's why you see the decay features. And also, um, if we have a centered Gaussian in the image, then, uh, so as I mentioned before, a sharp, a wider feature will be tra uh, transformed into a narrower feature and vice versa. So if we have a centered, more narrower Gaussian, the Fourier transform will, of course, be a wider Gaussian. But um, sorry, the sh slides aren't being shared. I just uh, caught that. Oh, <laughs> note. Oh sorry no. About that. Oh sorry goodness. about that. So maybe I should. Um, Good. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, sorry about that for online participants. Um, okay, yeah, so I was talking about that the centered Gaussian uh, will be transformed into a widely a wider spread Gaussian in terms of amplitude, but uh, now I want to focus on what the face can tell us. So since this is centered in the image, the face will of course be zero, but uh, if we have the offset Gaussian from the center, then the amplitude will basically be exactly the same, but there are fringe patterns that um, um, tells us where um, where this Gaussian is at. And so um, another important note about Fourier transform is amplitude tells you how much of a spatial frequency and phase tells you where the spatial frequency is.
So now we know that the image is simply the Fourier transform of the UV space, which is sampled by the antenna arrays. And now let's see how exactly does the observation works. So um, the idea is that uh, the radio antenna arrays basically sent is actually sampling the frequency domain. So it's sampling the UV space. And we want to ensure that we have enough sample, sample points on this UV domain so that we can reconstruct the image in a better fidelity. And uh, so the idea is that we have an array to synthesize a large aperture antenna of size of the maximum, uh, maximum baseline pair. So for example, uh, for two antennas here, we have one baseline and that will correspond to two UV points, which is a pair of UV points on the UV plane. And then well, if we have more antennas, then we can sample more on the UV space. But we could also fill in the, uh, the rest of the space with Earth rotation, which uh, like each, like for example, a pair of UV points will um, um, that will form a continuous track, like if there is Earth rotation. And we could also reconfigure the layout of different antennas, like more, bright, more widely spread or more compact um, to, like de depends on uh, whether we want to, we want more sampling on the higher spatial frequency or the lower spatial frequency. So here are some real examples from SMA, the sublinear array in Monakea. So uh, SMA is the eight antenna array. So it only has eight antennas. And this figure here is showing the most extended configuration of SMA. So this big black dots here are um, the location of antenna. So you can see it is uh, the very extended configuration. So here, the corresponding UV coverage is here. So basically, uh, like each each pair of antennas will form um, a pair of lines here, and this continuous track is formed by our rotation by like allowing time elapse. And so yeah, so because this is the most extended configuration, you can see that the UV uh, coverage is up to like five hundred kilo lambda in terms of wavelengths. And this is the second most extended configuration. The extended configuration, you can see clearly like the UV coverage narrows down to, um, to the more, uh, more concentrated at the center. And this is the compact one configuration, so even more compact in UV coverage. So uh, we could also combine all these configuration to ensure we get the most complete coverage of UV space. So this, this is the most ideal case. But still, um, still you can see like even if we combine uh, all these configurations, there are still a lot of space. Like we are not really completely sampling the UV parameters. So we have to know what does it mean if, um, if our UV coverage is not complete. So here I'm showing again the previous example of this image. So if we mask out the high spatial, all the high spatial frequency uh, in our visibilities, and then do an inverse Fourier transform, uh, sorry, a Fourier transform, then you can see this very blurred image because it is only uh, reconstructing the wide, like the diffuse structure. So you, uh, you cannot see the details, but only the, um, the blurred version of it. But if we do it oppositely, if we mask out the low spatial frequency, then um, basically what you can see is only the, uh, the sharp features that um, gives us the, um, like you can, you can only see the lines, the transitions, but not like, like, oh, like we don't know this paper is wide and where is black on this, on this image. So, uh, and this figure here shows the UV space sampled by ALMA. So you can see that co like comparing with the previous SMA, like we have 66 antenna for ALMA and the UV coverage is like uh, much, much better than only sampling with eight antennas. 
But um, but you can you can still see that there is, for example, this big central hole here, and this is um, we we will have this problem because uh, the um, the shortest baseline of two antennas is always limited because at least for example we can see that the shortest baseline cannot be shorter than the dish size right or else they will like just collapse so we always have this central hole problem that we cannot sample the shortest uh, the lowest spatial frequency part and so we uh we need to solve this um so that's why uh, i mentioned that in addition to the 12 meter uh, main array of ELMA, we also have the ACA array with only seven meter and also some 12 meter uh, used for single dish observation. So they are used for um, for uh, compensating these uh, central hole in the UV sense. So these are some real data from ELMA. Uh, it's an observation on M100 uh, nearby the Odyssey. So for example, you can see the 12 meter only image is only showing the high, uh, the higher resolution features like uh, really um, like detailed variations on, like for example, the center of galaxies. And the seven meter, on the other hand, only shows the broad and diffuse structure that like, for example, we can no longer see the structure in the center. And so what we really need is both, right? So we need to combine uh, these image and also, it's not it's not only like the seven meter has the problem because in uh, for example in higher resolution observation without the short spacing, uh, you can see many diffuse emission are being resolved out right. So for example, this diffuse uh, component here is not seen in the twelve meter images as well. So we really need to um, get both the uh, high and low spatial frequency observations. So as a summary, uh, the long baseline, uh, I mean, the longest baseline of the array basically determines the largest angular structure. Uh, sorry, the largest baseline basically determines the smallest angular structure, and that is the uh, angular resolution of our observation. But the shortest distance between antennas determines the largest uh, angular structure, and that is the maximum angular scale we can recover. And so for uh, for radio interferometer observation, we really need to think about both of these. So usually people tend to just think about resolution, but uh, the large angular scale can also be a uh, be a big problem because if you could imagine that, like if we are observing a star forming region, like they may have diffuse and hot gas, but if we only use like twelve meter observation, then those we will no longer see those structure. So this is the downside, but there are also upsides, upsides of this. So for example, we don't really need to care about like the sky brightness effects or the atmospheric effects because those are really large scale. So they will always be resolved out with uh, interferometer observations. And also there is a field of view. So the field of view is determined by um, wavelength uh, over the antenna diameter. So, so um, yeah, so, so basically the antenna, antenna diameter will determine um, how large of the field you could observe. But if you want to observe larger field, there's, uh, it's not a problem because uh, you could do uh, multiple pointings uh, in a mosaic to map a larger region. So here's a table that lists the largest and smallest angular scale of ELMA in different bands and different configuration. So you can find this in the uh, ELMA, ELMA proposal guide. So this 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 is a is a cycle ten version, but the cycle eleven version is already out on the website. So so yeah. So for cycle eleven, you will also see C nine and C ten because like this version for previous years like. C9 and C10 is not available. So, um, so yeah, so these are important information to consider. You need to see, like, for example, if you want to propose um, C2 configuration with band four, then like you will need to know like 
it can only um, cover a maximum scale of like 15 milliseconds. But like you actually don't need to worry about this when you prepare the observing tool because uh, they will actually automatically calculate for you and let you, let you know like with your desired resolution and your desired ang maximum angular source, they will figure out for you that whether you need additional configuration or, um, or ways to fulfill your requirement. So just keep in mind that spatial scales larger than the smallest baseline cannot be imaged, and spatial scales smaller than the largest baseline cannot be resolved. So this is the main takeaway. Uh, and finally, I want to mention that the UV coverage also really matters when we reduce the data because uh, what we initially get by Fourier transforming the, um, the visibility data is actually the dirty image, which um, of course includes the effects of the incomplete UV sampling. And so um, what we do for data reduction is that we get this dirty image and then we still need to subtract out um, the effects caused by incomplete sampling. So, so this means the dirty beam, or we call the point spread function. So the dirty beam or point spread function is basically the Fourier transform of this UV coverage. And so um, we could iter iteratively extract um, this dirty beam from the dirty image and then get a clean image that reflects the real sky brightness. So this is the data reduction part, and it actually involves a lot of details. But um, since this is a data, uh, this is a our proposal workshop, I'm not going to focus too much on this, but this will definitely be covered in, as I mentioned, the data processing and reduction workshop in fall, which is later of this year. So um, stay tuned if you are interested in this part. And so finally, I just want to uh, quickly demonstrate uh, the effects of UV coverage and the dirty beam. So for example, uh, this is the case when we only have two antennas. So in the case of two antennas, we only have one pair of uh, UV points, right, on the UV plane. And so uh, the recovered uh, the, uh, the recovered image, well, like we can only have fringe patterns in one direction because we only have one point, one pair of points. And this doesn't really tell us anything, right? But as soon as we uh, start to um, add more and more antenna, so like when we add one more antenna, now there is three pair of UV points and you can start to see the difference. And then if we add more, then the, like you can see a better point spread function, right? And so, yeah, and this is even more, uh, even more antennas, but like with more extended configuration, so the beam becomes smaller, so the resolutions increased. And this is 32 antennas instantaneous, but as I mentioned, we could always use the Earth rotation um, to get the uh, continuous track. And so if we like expose for for a few hours, for eight hours in this case, you can see. Uh, basically a decent 30 beam. And this point spread function is, uh, as I as I show, it's very important for data reduction. So if we have a good point spread function, that it will be much easier for us to recover what is the true brightness instead of artifacts from these um, incomplete samplings. Okay, so uh, my final slide. Uh, yeah, sure. Uh, these eight hours, are like uh, continuous hours or like a split? Let's say if you want to observe something, you observe for two hours and then another two hours and then half an hour and so on and so until you reach eight hours or are these eight hours like of continuous observation? Uh -huh. So uh, it can actually be both, but for the example I showed, so you see, uh, like, for example, like if you see uh, like a continuous track, like if it's like very continuous, then it is most likely like observing con continuously. 
So you can like also say like, for example, observing for some a few consecutive nights, then you could still like get um, coverage on the users, but it will just not be that continuous as shown here. But it, it also works because like what we want is just to sample the UV space as complete as possible. Okay, yeah, so just a final recap of the key parameters in interferometry. So the sensitive sensitivity of radio interferometry is determined by the number of antennas times their area. So basically just the total collecting area of the antennas gives us the sensitivity and L1 is really good at that. And the field of view is given by the beam size of a single antenna, which is determined by the wavelength and the dish size of a single antenna. And the resolution is given by the, the maximum baseline, which is uh, the further distance two antennas are. And the largest angular scale is uh, determined by the shortest distance between two antennas, because that gives us the uh, low spatial frequency space that recovers the widest possible structure. Okay, so this is uh, the end of my talk on introduction to radio interferometry. Uh, so before we get to the next science talk, are there any questions? Yes. <laughs> are you going to share the, the slides with us? The slides? Yes. I think so. Yeah, uh, I might need to ask NIO for this, but I think that should be fine. Yeah, I'll bet I get that too soon. Um, how often do you get weather out to the moment? Like, how often do weather conditions make it so that you can't observe? So that actually depends on the frequency, spatial frequency. So um, uh, if, you, if you recall, like in my overview talk, I show like different bands that Alma covers, right? And, and actually you can see different atmospheric transmission. So you can, yeah, I'm not sure. Did I show this in this talk? <laughs> May okay, maybe not in this talk, but um, but later I will show again. So you so basically you can see like uh, higher spatial frequency, like band eight, band nine, or band ten. The atmosphere transmission is much poorer than the lower frequency band. So in those bands, we really need good weather conditions to get useful observations. But for like uh, typical band three to band six, so like the transmission rate is almost like like 90, 90% or something. So in that case, we don't weather too much. Just note that um, it also depends on, so almost Q scheduled, right? So like if the weather is bad on a certain day, they just don't schedule things that require that kind of weather. Um, and if you're depending on the ranking of your project, right, if you either are available in the queue for one year, which is um, B or C, or you are, if you have an A ranked project, you're in the queue for two years. So um, there's, you know, it still definitely gets weathered out. But <laughs> if you're asking for like band 10 or something, and, uh, you know, you have to be in like a certain configuration, um, it's definitely possible that. The period of time that the telescope is in that configuration, if it coincides with bad weather, which in some cases is not unlikely, um, that you would miss that possibility. Yeah, I was going to have a dumb question, but what's considered bad weather for radio astronomy? Um, <laughs> so a lot of it depends on the water vapor, actually. Because uh, water vapor could really affect, like they could as absorb many of the um, millimeter wavelengths we are observing. So, like once um, it is it is very humid, then um, the transmission will basically go down. Yeah. So I think that's the main. I mean, there's also coherence, like the phase coherence, right? Um, so I think that's turbulence. So some some aspect of turbulence in the atmosphere could also be a problem. Uh huh. Yeah, that's right. Because uh, when we observe, we have to like do calibration first. Like we have to, for example, ensure that, uh, for example, if the if some source is at the center, then the phase 
we measure have to be zero, right? And like if you have turbulence or atmosphere atmosphere um, perturbation, then that would makes it impossible. Like sometimes, sometimes. So yeah, atmospheric effect. We do have some experts on water. Yeah. <laughs> if you wanted to add anything. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Okay. Uh, so if there's no more question, then we can move to the science talk uh, by Alice. So I think uh, you could just, yeah, just join, love us, join on the yeah.